now I'm going to switch a gear and uh, we're going to be talking about regional anesthesia for primary breast cancer surgery, the use of thoracic paravertebral block. Can you do it? Is it really possible? And if it is possible, how is it possible? And if it is not possible, why is it not possible? So there must be more to it than what has been described in the literature. Uh, I have no conflict of interest whatsoever relating to this presentation. So whatever you will hear is from, based on my most of my research. So therefore, some unpublished data will be presented uh, in, in the interest of clarity. We will have a few polling uh, questions during this presentation. So I urge you to please poll yes or no to some of these questions. So the first question to you, ladies and gentlemen, is have you ever used thoracic paravertebral block as the sole anesthetic technique for primary breast cancer surgery? So let me pull out the poll for you. So please click here, yes or no. You have 30 seconds starting now. Don't hesitate, please. Okay, so I'm going to end the poll and uh, share the results to you. So the so the registrants have polled saying that 80% of you have never used paravertebral block for major primary breast cancer surgery. That's a good start because then we can introduce you to the ways that you can really do it in your clinical practice. Of course, it will need some, uh, some practice and know-how. And this is where we are going to deliver it to you. So my objective is to um, describe why paravertebral block may be useful for surgical anesthesia for primary breast cancer surgery. I think needless to say that there are often patients who are not suitable for general anesthesia, but there may be some other indications where um, there is no um, randomized studies uh, at this very moment, but I think uh, when we look at other evidence from paravertebral block, this may also be translated to multi-level paravertebral blocks. Uh, I will then innovate, uh, sorry, review the innovation of the breast. We will recap some of the basics of paravertebral block that we've already covered in our previous webinars. And in the interest of those of you who may not have been there, I will introduce you to some of the key concepts. Then we'll see what works and what does not, and if it does not, why it does not work. I will then introduce you to a new concept of pectoral plexus block. Now, primary breast cancer surgery is very frequently performed all around the world. In fact, it may be considered one of the most commonly performed procedures in many centers around the world, particularly in females. It is traditionally performed under general anesthesia. It, produ it produces moderate to severe post-operative pain. Often the pain is unlike when you experience or patients experience with thoracotomy or say major abdominal surgery. Neuropathic pain is a major component of this pain that occurs after breast surgery. And this is even manifested as early as in the post-operative ward. This surgery is associated with a high incidence of post-op nausea and vomiting. But I have to say that as our techniques of anesthesia have changed, I think these incidences are a little bit overestimated. But these are data from an era of, of the use of volatiles primarily. And even with the use of antiemetics, they still suffer from PONV. Thoracic paravertebral block has been advocated as an alternative technique to general anesthesia since the late 1990s, when Dr. Greengrass and the group from um, the Mayo Clinic in the United States published their work on paravertebral block in conjunction with sedation. And in fact, it became so popular that patients indeed 
um, demanded they have paravertebral blocks. And I believe they were also in in the Times magazine because of this popularity and the and the buzz that it had surrounding the use of this technique in patients undergoing major breast cancer surgery. There's also growing evidence today that it may have a role in reducing chronic pain. And we have also demonstrated that it could improve quality of life after these patients return to the community. So in order to really understand how you could use paravertebral block for surgical anesthesia uh, for primary breast cancer surgery, one has to understand a few key, few key concepts. One is what kind of tissue destruction actually occurs during this surgery? Now, there's a host of different techniques that are described, but when you look at primary breast cancer surgery, it may primarily be described as a surgery that involves um, removing the breast lump, which is um, modified radical mastectomy. They remove the, the parenchyma of the breast with the fascia overlying the pectoralis minor muscle, major muscle. And then they do a central lymph node biopsy. And depending on the results of the biopsy of the lymph node, they do an axillary dissection. So you could have a simple mastectomy with just a simple central and lymph node biopsy and a combination of different kind of, uh, of uh, breast conservative surgery, which only involves the parenchyma and neither the fascia of the pectoral muscle or the pectoral muscles at all. Radical mastectomy is actually uh, a, a thing of the past when it was a very destructive operation, not only removal of the breast, but including the, uh, the muscles and the entire axillary lymph node chain surrounding relating to it. Next concept we need to understand is what is the innovation of the breast? Actually, the innovation of the breast is very complex. I've in indeed been chasing the dream of performing primary breast cancer surgery with paravertebral blocks for more than close to two decades now, and I still don't know the answer. But I have developed a lot of wisdom along the way, which I will share with you today. I would really highly recommend this um, review article by Dr. Glenn Woodworth and colleagues uh, who describe in this uh, qualitative review of the anatomy uh, and innovation of the breast. And I think this is the most complete de description in our literature. So when you look at innovation of the breast, we need to consider not only the skin and uh, the cutaneous innovation, but also the parenchyma, the axilla, and in particularly, uh, there's growing evidence that afferent nociception is also contributed from particularly the pectoral muscles and maybe even the serratus anterior and the latissimus dorsi, which are closely related to the breast or to the axillary lymph node dissection. So the intercostal nerves are a major contributor to the cutaneous and, uh, in, and parenchymal innovation of the breast. Innovation comes from the, uh, to the breast gum from T2 to T6, and maybe also T7 in most cases. But note that there is no you know, contribution from T1 on the anterior part of the chest wall. Now, in, there are many uh, textbooks in, in, in region anesthesia of the past who actually describe the T1 anteriorly. But as you can see, this is the more evidence-based dermatomal map that actually has no innovation on the anterior chest wall relating to T1. So it begs the question, do you really need a T1 injection when you perform these, these procedures? Nevertheless, uh, it also receives innovation from uh, the other uh, nerves that are in, in its vicinity. The intercostal nerves provide innovation to the lateral cutaneous branches, particularly the medial branch, which is indeed defined as the, um, as the medial mammary nerves. These, are, these become the, the lateral mammary nerves. And as the and a branch from the uh, the medial branch of the anterior cutaneous branch of the intercostal nerve forms the the medial mammary nerves. So you have from T2 to T6, you have these uh, medial and lateral mammary nerves that uh, innovate the the skin and the parenchyma of the breast. You can see here in these cartoons that they are represented here T2 to T6, and also in this picture from Dr. Woodwards. You can see how the anterior branches of the lateral cutaneous nerves, these are indeed the lateral memory nerves and the medial branches of the anterior cutaneous nerve from the medial memory branches, the T2 to T6 
supply most of this innovation. There's over an overlap, sometimes also from the contralateral side. The supraclavicular nerves, from, particularly from the uh, superficial cervical plexus, so take from a C4 to C5, through the three nerves, the medial, intermediate, and lateral, provide innovation to the upper part of the, um, the flap of the breast, particularly when they are dissecting the upper flap of the breast to gain access to the parenchyma and the, uh, the base of the breast over the pectoral muscles. The pectoral nerves uh, are gaining in um, popularity amongst our speciality, the, uh, often described as the lateral and medial pectoral nerves. Uh, as you will see that, if you review the literature in depth, you'll find that the concept of the pectoral nerve as being two nerves is rather simplistic. And it's naive to think that two injections to the lateral and medial pectoral nerves will produce blockade of, this, of, these, of the pectoral nerves that innervate mostly the muscles uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the chest wall, particularly the pec major and minor. These are some of the references that I will be referring to during this presentation. The lateral pectoral nerve emerges from the lateral cord. The medial pectoral nerve emerges from the medial cord. So it's usually from C5, 6, the lateral pectoral, and the C8, T1 is the medial pectoral nerve. This is right out of uh, Gray's anatomy, if you may, ladies and gentlemen. And this is how it is described. Also is described in many um, textbooks that the pectoral nerves are indeed motor, pure motor nerves. I think they're growing evidence that there are no pure motor nerves in the body. Uh, they have uh, sensory innovation. Uh, they have sensory, sensory fibers within them. They also contain sympathetic fibers. Now let's take a look at this uh, paper from uh, Clinical Anatomy by this group of researchers from um, Birmingham, Alabama. And they said that, quoted that, the peripheral nerves, the, the pectoral nerves are mainly considered motor nerves, but they may also contain sensory fibers uh, as they innovate the shoulder, and they also supply innovation to the um, to the uh, acromioclavicular joints and many other aspects that are related to the shoulder. So they are involved with afferent nociception from the shoulder, and therefore they are also involved with afferent nociception from the breast via the pectoral muscles. Similarly, it has been shown that the spinal accessory nerves also contains sensory fibers that are non-proprioceptive sensory function uh, that serves non-proprioceptive sensory function, including pain. Furthermore, to think about the lateral pectoral nerve as two simple nerves, as I mentioned, is rather naive because you can see there's great variation in the origin of the lateral and the medial pectoral nerves, even from the inferior trunk, uh, sorry, from the inferior trunk or the uh, medial cord and from the upper trunk, which is the lateral cord. There is marked variation as shown in this, uh, in this particular publication. Another publication that I highly recommend to you is this publication, the Journal of Plastic Reconstructive and Aesthetic Surgery by Sylvian David and their, research, and their research group. What they described is that in their cadaver dissection, they'd performed about 26 dissections in 15 cadavers, and they found that the pectoral nerves were indeed not two nerves. They were three consistent branches of the pectoral nerves and they could define them very consistently in dissection after dissection. You can see here, there is a superior branch, a middle branch, and an inferior branch. All this crisscross along um, the, um, in the infraclavicular area close to the origin of the thoracoacromial artery. Now the thoracoacromial artery will be an important landmark for you ladies and gentlemen. So do remember that you can see here the superior branch, the middle branch and the inferior branch, including the ancestor pectoralis, which is the, the fiber that crisscross and communicates between these branches are also very closely related to the thoracochromial artery. These nerves are not small nerves. You can see here, they are relatively sized nerves and they are the superior, middle and the inferior branches of the pectoral nerves. Also this work by Dr. Lee, from Korea showed that there were marked variation in the spinal region of the lateral and medial pectoral nerves. So the thing that the lateral pectoral nerve <coughs> receives only in a contribution from C5, 6, uh, or the medial pectoral nerve receives only from the C8 and T1 is, uh, <coughs> um, is naive in that respect. As you can see here, there's marked variation in the contributions of the different uh, spinal nerves towards the lateral 
and towards the formation of the medial pectoral nerve. So much so, <clears throat> based on the available literature at the time, Dr. Lee and their group described a subpectoral plexus of nerve. This is a network of nerve that are between and deep to the pectoral muscles. They come from the C5, 6, 7, 8, and T1. This is pretty much like what you see with the brachial plexus. The roots of the brachial plexus are C5, 6, 7, 8, and T1. By C5 and 6 join and form mostly the superior branch, which is, may represent the lateral pectoral nerve. The C7 continues as the middle branch, uh, which may represent the answer pectoralis nerves, which communicates with both, with the older concept. And the C8 and T1 from the from the inferior branch, which would be the medial pectoral nerve from the older concept. So all this is happening uh, deep to and between the pectoral muscles and in very close uh, relationship to the to the thoracoacromial artery. <clears throat> as you can see in this dissection by Dr. Salablanche from um, Barcelona, as you <laughs> split the pectoral muscles, you can see there's an intricate network of very fine nerves that are not only deep to the pectoral muscle, also in between the pectoral muscles, uh, between the pectoralis major and the minor. And we will come to that uh, in more detail shortly. Other branches that are the long thoracic and thoracodorsal nerves have also been um, implicated as being involved with afferent nociception, but the exact contribution to afferent nociception is still not known. Um, there's, very positive, there's a positive data on this area, but given that uh, the pectoral muscles, the uh, pectoral nerves that innervate the pectoral muscles contribute to an afferent nociception. And if you look at the serratus anterior supplied by the long thoracic nerve and the latissimus dorsi, particularly when they're doing latissimus dorsi flaps, et cetera, thoracodorsal nerve block may be desirable. Again, today we are not um, very clear about the contribution of the thoracodorsal and, and the long thoracic nerve. So it is usually in my practice, I don't, usually block these nerves because very rarely the surgeon um, operates or involves uh, this area of innovation. Also the, media, uh, the sympathetic fibers via the middle cervical ganglia and the stellate ganglion provide postganglionic sympathetic fibers that are involved with, uh, with afferent nociception. There are also some associated anatomy and I mentioned some of that to you before. Uh, is the thoracoacromial arch is very closely related to the superior middle and the ansa, ansa pectoralis and the inferior branch. And these branches, particularly the middle and the inferior, actually uh, go into the interpectoral plane uh, where the uh, thoracoacromial, uh, uh, the pectoral branch of the thoracoacromial artery is located. Now, some, in some individual, it's very difficult to define the interpectoral plane between the pec major and minor. A surrogate marker for that would be to look for the uh, pectoral branch of the thoracoacromial artery and perform the injection adjacent to it. So the innovation of the breast, ladies and gentlemen, is rather complex. It not only receives innovation from the intercostal nerves via the T2 to T6, but also the infraclavicular area receives innovation from the supraclavicular nerves. The lateral and medial pectoral nerve, although have no cutaneous innovation, but by innovating the uh, the apparent chyma and the uh, uh, and the uh, sorry the by innovating the muscles they uh, uh, contribute to overall afferent nociception. Uh, they are also overlapping uh, innovation across the midline. So despite your best efforts, sometimes overlapping um, innovation may uh, result in a in a patients reporting pain. Okay, with this background, if we now look at the dermatomal cover that you really need for a major breast cancer surgery, primary breast cancer surgery, like uh, modified mastectomy, then you need somewhere from C4 to T6. And really, that's a, that's a many nerves or many paravertebral injections for you, ladies and gentlemen. But then today it is not really known what are the major contributors to this. Certainly the intercostal nerves do contribute um, in a major way to the afferent nociception, uh, but the exact role of the supraclavicular nerves the, um, the thoracodorsal lat long thoracic nerve is still not, not known. Now let's take a look at paravertebral blocks and we have uh, discussed at length many uh, aspects of this. I'm going to quickly cover some of this here. So paravertebral injection is a technique inject adjacent to the um, intervertebral foramina. It's a very uh, interesting 
repository uh, location because it not only contains the somatic nerves, but also the sympathetic nerves. So uh, an injection of local anesthetic into the paravertebral space via spread to the epidural, to the intercostal, via the paravertebral route, and often also from the via the pre-vertebral route can spread to the contralateral side. They communicate, the paravertebral spaces communicate with each other. So uh, an injection into one space can spread easily to the contiguous sites, producing multidermatomal, segmental, somatic, and sympathetic nerve blockage. So you get uh, ipsilateral, it is segmental, it is somatic and sympathetic thoracic nerve blockade. And this is a, a good uh, image for you to illustrate uh, what really happens after the injection. You can see there was some air was used as loss of resistance to identify the paravertebral space. You can see here that there is some spread to the retrolamular space. There is spread to the epidural space, the spread to the paravertebral and the intercostal space. Note that ipsilateral epidural spread is, is very common after a paravertebral injection. Uh, to 70 to 80 percent of them will exhibit um, epidural spread after a single injection. Uh, if you perform multiple injections, the epidural spread is much more evident. Therefore, the ipsilateral somatic and sympathetic nerve blockade can be useful for unilateral type of surgery. Now, in this era when ultrasound guidance has been the, uh, the go-to for paravertebral blocks, there are some minor changes in our uh, in the techniques. So several ultrasound guided techniques have been described today, but no optimal techniques are known. Success of a paravertebral block is ultrasound guidance has been shown to be superior than a landmark-based technique. Good work by Dr. Patnaik and their group. Our medial injection techniques produce greater epidural spread. There's a wider segmental uh, spread of anesthesia and analgesic efficacy is also greater with a medial uh, technique. This work by Dr. Takeda and their group from Japan has shown a paralaminar approach uh, may be desirable. Large volume injections also produce wider segmental anesthesia. Now, whether you use a single or a multiple injection, uh, that's debatable, but generally for anesthesia, if you want consistent, repeatable anesthesia, then multiple injection is the go-to. A single injection can still be uh, limited by its uh, coverage of certain dermatomes, and we will come to that. Rural puncture is rare in experience and trained hands, but can still occur even with ultrasound guidance. So being trained and uh, and uh, getting gaining some experience under supervision is always desirable. Some of the new concepts about the anatomy of the paravertebral block, a paravertebral space that Dr. Cho and the group have recently published from um, Korea is, um, is very interesting conceptually um, and requires further clinical evaluation. And I'm sure you will hear more about this in the near future. I mentioned to you in my previous, last week's presentation that we use the transverse scan at the level of the articular process. It's an in-plane needle insertion techniques. Today, we have performed more than four or five thousands of these injections with almost, uh, we have had no pleural punctures or pneumothoraces so far. We use a curved linear transducer. It's uh, used in a sequential manner, starting from the transverse process and rib, and then it's slowly translated to the inferior articular process level. The inferior articular process is very important because the inferior articular process is related to the intervertebral foramina. As you can see here, this is the rib transverse process. This is the level of the transverse process. And as you are at the level of the inferior articular process, you can see there is no obstruction in front of you and the wedge-shaped paravertebral space is, is visible. We use a curved linear transducer because it gives you a wide field of view. And as you can see here, you can see the spinous process, the lamina, the posterior directed transverse process and its articulation and the rib. This is the first window. The next window is the transverse process window where you now don't have the rib. You can see the lung sliding sign with the plural here and the thick ligament uh, uh, behind it. The apical part of the paravertebral space is also visible. And you can indeed place a needle here as Dr. Shibata and the group from Japan have demonstrated many, many years ago. Uh, further, if you go more caudally, uh, your transverse process shadow is no more visible. You now see the inferior articular process as this osseous structure with the shadow and this triangular space uh, to your 
paper. To the right of the article, indeed, the wedge shape pair of vertebral space. And this is the our target uh, ultrasound window for ultrasound guided paravertebral injections. Uh, this is just a quick recap of the three ultrasound windows aiming for the inferior articular process. And the osseous window changes until you can see only the inferior articular process at the target ultrasound window with the triangular wedge shaped space. Also do remember that the intervertebral foramen is very closely related to the articular process. So going too close to the foramen would also not be desirable. So while injecting it medially is, is desirable, but going too medial is not desirable. So how you can work out a balance is, is sometimes a difficult situation. Okay, the in-plane needle insertion occurs, and this is the typical ergonomics of how we perform. You use an assistant to help you to perform the injections. Uh, this is the target ultrasound window. Uh, this is obviously a better view in, 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 uh, in most patients. You don't see this. But is, this is a presentation, I'm going to show you a better view, okay? The needle is inserted in plane from a lateral to medial direction. We use echogenic needles. You can see here, visibility is very good. Uh, the ergonomics are, are good. Uh, and the needle is inserted from a lateral to medial direction. Originally, we were aiming for the apex, but now we aim for somewhere between the apex and the medial part of the paravertebral space. Uh, aiming to inject as medially as possible. Once you perform the injection, you will see anterior displacement of the pleura, widening of the paravertebral space. As you will see here, the needle is being introduced in plane from a lateral to medial direction, aiming to place it at the paravertebral space, after which you insert, you inject saline. Saline should always be the, um, the first injection before you inject the local anesthetic. Uh, if you can see the spread of the saline in the paravertebral space, that also excludes to a certain extent intravascular injection. And then when you see the, um, uh, the, the displacement of the pleura and the widening of the paravertebral space, that heralds injection of the local anesthetic, then it injects the correct paravertebral injection. So how do we conduct anesthesia? Now, in, initially we performed uh, six injections because this is what was suggested in the literature from T1 to T6 as a multi, multiple injections and uh, with, with in conjunction with sedation. So the anesthesia was conducted. We sedate our patients by giving midazolam one to two milligrams IV. Once they are positioned, they have been put on oxygen and we monitor the CO2 via nasal cannula. And they're given 10 to 20 milligrams of ketamine uh, for comfort during the procedure. We start an infusion of dexmedetomidine, depending on the age and um, uh, and the body habitus, somewhere between 0.1 and 0.5 mics per kilo per hour. Uh, we don't give a bolus of dexmedetomidine infusion because we find it induces a lot of bradycardia in some of these elderly patients. So midazolam is the is the um, inducer of sedation, if you may, and then dexmedetomidine catches up in about half an hour's time when patients are indeed maintaining awake sedation or conscious sedation. Uh, this is uh, the ergonomics you can see here. I've shown you these pictures before. Uh, we mark the level under strict aseptic precautions to perform these injections. Of course, it is very important when you perform these injections to try and maximize the chance of success and to use your, uh, your dominant hand as much as possible. And I will just illustrate to you. Ensure that uh, the side up is always the side of the block. So timeout procedure should be an uh, integral part of it. I performed a wrong-sided paravertebral block in my life once, and I hope I don't do it again, which I hope I will not. So you can perform six injections, but today it is our practice to perform three alternate injections, and I will come to that, how this has come to be. We perform between T2 and T3, T4 and uh, <coughs> T5, and then T6 and T7. So these are three injections that we perform. Now, uh, when you perform these blocks, it's, it's paramount that you position your patient in such a way that you are able to use your dominant hand for the needle uh, needling. Otherwise, uh, you may find yourself in a position where you have your non-dominant hand when you you'll obviously uh, chances of success are very low. Strict aseptic precaution under local infiltration. The needle is inserted from a lateral to medial direction. Uh, we use echogenic needles today because the angle of insertion can sometimes be steep 
And visualizing the needle is not as simple as doing many peripheral nerve blocks. And since uh, the uh, the risk of uh, inadvertently puncturing the pura is very high, we um, we use echogenic needles for all paravertebral injections. Um, we use an assistant to help us uh, inject the saline first. And once you confirm the needles in the correct place, you then can change it to the local anesthetic. We deposit somewhere between six to eight mils of local anesthetic at alternate levels today. As we said, T2, T4, and T6. And we inject 0.5 ropivacaine or levivacaine, uh, but we add epinephrine because it reduces systemic absorption and reduces the potential for systemic toxicity. As I mentioned, if you are trained and you have uh, the experience, as we show in this uh, retrospective follow-up that rural puncture incidence uh, zero, this is a follow-up of more than 500 patients with more than 1,500 individual paraverbal injections in a breast unit only, where pleural puncture was actually zero. There were no incidents of clinical pneumothoracis. Sedation is maintained intraoperatively using dexmedetomidine. Patients listen to music, and they are still in verbal contact with you if you ask them. Uh, and this is the, the layout of how we uh, do it. You can see here the pectoral is, <laughs> the breast is, Remove from the uh, with the fascia from the pectoral major muscle using diathermy. So often you will see a lot of muscle contraction. So how to use it for paravertebral blockade is the next. You can, as I showed you, you can do multiple injections, but I think there is a role for single injections too. And um, single injection can be quite a useful tool and a powerful tool for major breast cancer, particularly primary breast cancer surgery. Multi levels are mostly used for. Uh, surgical anesthesia. Now, do you perform C7 to T6, T1 to T6, or just perform uh, a three injection? These are all, again, uh, up for studies, uh, but our clinical experience is three are usually adequate today in the day of ultrasound guidance. Folks have also described continuous catheter techniques for breast surgery, but we have abandoned the use of catheters in patients undergoing breast surgery uh, many years ago, and I will mention that, mention why to you in a, in a short while. So a single injection is performed at uh, T3, T4, 25 to 30 cc's of local anesthetic sign is injected. Now, my next question to you is, based on your understanding of the innovation of the breast and uh, the uh, dynamics that uh, a paravertebral block can achieve, okay, do you think uh, a single injection will be adequate for surgical anesthesia? Please poll now. Okay, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so very rightly, 85% majority, if you say that it is not going to be effective, very correct. I think uh, a single injection, you may be lucky on a Monday, but don't expect to be lucky every day of the week because although single injection ultrasound guided blocks can produce quite extensive sensory motile blockade, but to provide anesthesia that is needed for surgical anesthesia, you may have to do just more than uh, uh, a single injection. So uh, the norm is to perform multi-level injections. Okay, um, this is a study by Dr. Upal uh, and the group. I think they were at in London with Dr. Ganapathy at the time. They performed a uh, single injection and three injections, uh, paravertebral blocks uh, by injecting 20 to 25 cc's of local anesthetic. You can see here, they demonstrated there were no significant difference in dermatomal spread. But you can see here the, um, the number of patients who have T1 or T7 blockade are not all 100% of them. So you can see that it's not 100% in most cases. When you want it for surgical anesthesia, then you need 100% uh, sensory blockade. So I think this uh, is very interesting data, but it needs validation for surgery. In, uh, but nevertheless, a single injection can be very useful. It can help you to reduce um, opioid requirements, improve recovery. Uh, it also been shown to reduce the incidence of chronic pain six months, 12 months after surgery. We've also shown that it actually reduces severity of chronic pain symptoms and improves the quality of both physical and mental health three and six months after surgery. We also found that 
whether you perform a single injection or a, or a, or a, or, a, or a continuous infusion, uh, there are no differences in early or late outcomes. So since the uh, pain relieving uh, properties and its uh, chronic pain attenuating uh, effects of a single injection compared to a continuous infusion in relation to um, modified radical mastectomy are very similar, we have abandoned the use of continuous uh, catheters for primary breast cancer surgery. We use multimodal analgesia in conjunction with uh, paravertebral blocks. So multi-level injections of the T1 to T6 are frequently used. And my question to you now is, do you think a multi-level ultrasound guided paravertebral block will be effective as the sole anesthetic for primary breast cancer surgery uh, in conjunction with sedation? Please call now. So some of you are still undecided because we haven't reached, uh, okay, good. So I'm gonna end the poll now. So majority of you say that a single multi-level paravertebral in conjunction with sedation is going to be adequate for surgical anesthesia, but a few 25% of you more experienced and well-known individuals have very correctly said it would not be effective. Okay, so uh, let me show you some, some data relating to that and uh, how it may uh, relate to major breast primary breast cancer surgery. Now, in the days of its uh, helm, a multi-level paravertebral block in conjunction with sedation was used for surgical anesthesia, providing very effective anesthesia report in literature with minimal complication, high degree of patient satisfaction, including surgical satisfaction within the opera. As I said, it became very famous, including went to the, I wouldn't say a cover of the Times Magazine, but it was, it was really very popular at the time. Randomized studies also showed that a multi-level paravertebral block for surgical and reduces post-operative pain compared to those who receive only general anesthesia. It produces very long pain relief, prolonged pain relief, sometimes even, even out, um, you know, uh, it's a, it, the, the, the duration of block often outlasted the what expected duration of the block. And they also read very few anesthetic uh, or uh, analgesic requirements. To so much so, all this holistically improved post-op quality of recovery. And also there's some data to suggest that uh, there was shorter hospital stay. As I mentioned to you, I've been chasing this dream for about 22 decades now. But my experience have always been different. In the beginning, I thought maybe the uh, landmark-based techniques, some of them were not taken up well, so the patient reported pain. But now that we were started to use multi-level ultrasound-guided injections, where you could very objectively confirm the correctness of the injection, but we still found that majority of patients still reported pain while our patients were on dexmedetomidine uh, sedation. So it was very puzzling. In fact, this paper went from pillar to post to try and get this published, but eventually we published it. And this is uh, outlines our experience and that we presented uh, at the Journal of Pain Research in 2020. We showed that despite a multi-level paravertebral block, 80% of patients will report pain. And these patients require ketamine substitution Although the doses of ketamine are relatively low, but they usually require ketamine substitution. They require ketamine substitution, particularly during certain surgical interventions. One is when your surgeon is removing the, the fatty parenchyma of the breast from the pectoral muscles. While the muscles contract, the patients very synchronously will report a dull aching pain, uh, often it often thought as a as a as a failure of the paravertebral block, but do remember that it is this is not innervated by the paravertebral uh, nerves or the intercostal nerves, and the paravertebral block will not anesthetize these muscles. And it also proves that uh, there are afferent nociceptive signals that are being transmitted from the pectoral muscles during this uh, particular intervention. 
Uh, more recently, Dr. Patnaik and the group have also compared landmark and, uh, and ultrasound guidance. And in fact, uh, I'm pleased to report here their experience also is similar. If you see ultrasound guidance, 94% were actually successful in terms of producing the block. Uh, they also produced, uh, the ultrasound guidance also produced uh, better sensory blockade. They also produced um, greater uh, chances of um, reduced pain in the rest and movement. Uh, uh, this is in movement. The ultrasound was the winner. But look at this. Um, their experience is that 80% of patients, even despite the multi-level ultrasound guided paravertebral block required rescue analgesic requirement uh, in agreement with our data. So remember, ladies and gentlemen, that even if you do a multi-level paravertebral block, patients will still report pain. And I think the answer is quite obvious that there are other afferent nociceptors that are involved. And this is in fact uh, uh, a letter to the editor by Dr. Juan Guai from Canada, questioning the, the validity of a multi-level paravertebral block for, for uh, as efficacy for breast surgery when she actually tabulated the amount of sedation that many of these publications in the previous literature have actually given. Today, they would be considered as general anesthesia in, in most if you critically analyze them. So time for reflection. So the pectoral muscles are innervated by the pectoral nerves. So a paravertebral block will not block this. So um, it is it is um, suggest that these nerves are involved with afferent nociception. So we've been um, practicing a technique of uh, performing uh, pectoral nerve blocks for for a number of years now, and hopefully we have uh, we have mastered it so much so that uh, we we describe this as subpectoral plexus block based on the the subpectoral plexus concept described by Lee and their group. It is also uh, uh, using uh, performed in the supine position using a linear transducer, as you can see here. It's an in-plane needle insertion from a lateral to medial direction. We aim to place the, the transducer uh, in this uh, linear fashion here, aiming for the, the uh, visualizing the second part of the axillary artery with the pec major and the minor. Uh, you also look for the thoracoacromial artery, the origin of the thoracoacromial artery. And the previous slide, you saw the, uh, the vessels that are between the pec major and the minor. These are the uh, acromial, uh, sorry, the pectoral branch of the thoracoacromial artery. So the aim is to perform an injection between the two muscles and deep to the pectoral muscle, away from the slightly away from the where the thoracoacromial artery is visualized. It's an in-plane needle insertion. This is another perspective looking from the head end of the patient. You insert the needle uh, initially either to the interpectoral or the um, deep to the pectoral um, minor muscle. You, you saline to hydrodissect your way. Uh, may look dangerous, but you'll be very surprised that it's not so dangerous as it may appear to you. You can see here with saline and then we inject, we started with five mils of 0.25% ropivacaine because remember you've already injected quite a bit of local anesthetic for your paravertebral injection. Thereafter, the needle is withdrawn and a second injection is performed um, close to the thoracoacromial artery, or sorry, the uh, pectoral branch of the thoracoacromial artery between the pec major and the minor muscle. You see here, you will soon see separation of the two muscles and five mils of local anesthetic is deposited here. Now the question to you, ladies and gentlemen is, will a multi-level paravertebral block, this is a 6M, which is six injections with a subpectoral plexus block, as I described, be effective as the sole anesthetic for primary breast cancer surgery? So this is a question number Poll for you. Please poll if you would like to say yes or no. <clears throat> okay, so everybody is uh, getting more in tune with what I am trying to say. 80% of you say that it, oops, let me share this with you. So 80% of you say that. Uh, it will be effective for the primary breast cancer surgery, where 20% of you say no. I think uh, the 20% of you are indeed correct. Let me share some uh, some data with you here. 
So when we looked at our, our study, looking at 6M followed by the 10 ml of uh, this injection using this clinical trial registry, this study is still not yet published. We will in a short, it was presented at the last ASA meeting. And you will see that um, number of uh, patients who required ketamine was significantly greater in the patients who had only the multi-level. So the, uh, the pectoral plexus block the subpectoral plexus is, is indeed providing some uh, efficacy, as you can see here, it almost halves the number, to 94% versus 54%, uh, and the dose of ketamine requirement is also much lower in the subpectoral plexus block, but it does not eliminate the need for SQ analgesia. Now, the next question to you is, we've already done six injections, and we've done a subpectoral plexus block. Do you think, do you consider multiple injection six injections with a subpectoral plexus block as too many injections for a for a single patient please poll yes or no okay thank you okay so a majority of you say that they are indeed too many injections six injections followed by another interpectoral injection but interestingly when we uh, question these patients or interrogate these patients post-operatively, uh, given that they have received the sedation, they often have no recollection of the number of injections or what uh, they had had for their, for their surgery. But as a given that, I also felt that there were too many injections. We did a pilot study where we looked at performing alternate injections with a subpectral plexus block as we described. However, you can see here that um, that in this 30 patients that we did as a pilot under this clinical trial number, we found that even 5%, five of them required um, uh, us to hold a mask uh, with a volatile anesthetic for a short while, while uh, in one of the, in two of them, they were doing us the upper flaps, and in two, three of them, they were doing the auxiliary uh, lymph nodes. So uh, the rescue ketamine requirements uh, were were still required, uh, but you will see here that the respiratory ketamine requirements are relatively low. So you can indeed do uh, three injections uh, with a subpectoral plexus block for primary back, uh, breast cancer surgery, and this is quite consistent with what we are, are doing today. And in this study, we also looked at the power of the PEC major and the PEC minor, and you will see here that often most of them will still have normal motor function uh, when they are assessed in the recovery with a few, with uh, some weakness of the pec major and the minor, but no paralysis. Also, it is not known today uh, whether uh, you need a complete uh, blockade of the pectoral nerves for analgesia uh, or just a, a paresis like so would be adequate. Our data suggests that you don't need complete paralysis or, or of these um, nerves because it's not possible to assess sensory dermatomal innovation because they have no dermatomal innovation. So the only way to assess the uh, efficacy in the pectoral nerves is to assess their motor function. Surgeons were, you would say, a 70% satisfaction is, is relatively good, and today they are quite happy. Finally, uh, I think I've exceeded my time uh, by a bit, but today we are actually looking at the efficacy of 5 plus 5 versus 10 plus 10 mil injection. And our preliminary experience, uh, pilot experience, uh, indicates that uh, our hypothesis is that if you perform three injections in the paravertebral and you combine it with uh, the subpectoral plexus block with 10 and 10 mils of 0.25%, uh, you will have a better success. So try that out if you are um, in, in, in uh, performing this in your clinical practice. So my concluding remarks is that providing surgical anesthesia for primary breast cancer surgery is very complex. It's not as simple, or there is more to it than what meets the eye, as you, if you read the literature. Nevertheless, 80% of patients still require rescue uh, analgesia. Albeit, they are relatively small doses. And as long as you are aware at what points in the surgery they require pain, if you preempt these, uh, these surgical um, uh, steps, your patient will be uh, quite comfortable. A subpectoral plexus block does complement the anesthesia provided by a, by a multi-level block. However, future research is still warranted, and many of these are, are currently ongoing in our institution. 
Okay, I hope that gives you a lot of uh, food for thought to think about what paravertebral blocks are and what it can and it cannot do when it comes to breast surgery. So when you read about paravertebral blocks, be critical. Uh, with this background of information, I'm sure that you'll be able to um, interpret the results in a more a logical way.